Hi guys, I'm Mike. And I'm Mark. And this is F1 Fanatics. Welcome back and we are back with a feeder series episode and it's a bit of a special one today. Obviously one of our uh, resident series on the channels is F1 Who's Better Driver Rivalries. Well we thought as the season's approaching and kind of F2 has multiple Ferrari challengers and we have a guest today, uh, she's been on before. We'll introduce her in a second. But basically what we are going to be doing today is looking at three of the young stars in F2 and making a case for them and asking who's better. So we have Katie is joining us today. Katie obviously was on for an F1 Worldwide podcast. We know a big Kevin Magnussen fan and uh you know she was fantastic on that episode so we've invited her back so katie uh welcome thanks guys nice to be back again no problem at all thank you for taking the time to come out and so your three drivers today you probably would have seen them from the thumbnail but it is robert schwartzman mick schumacher callum eilat and you will see who will be fighting each as we go along and as usual on driver rivalries we will start off with some stats and then we are going to compare the drivers racecraft we're going to compare their pace we're going to compare the consistency before having a conclusion where we debate with each other and we may try to agree to come to some sort of conclusion and yes then we um yeah and then we will end the episode and we'll see if we're all friends again at the end of it but first of all, we're going to start off with Mark. And whose stats are you going to give us, Mark? Mick Schumacher's stats. So we'll start off with his wins. In his racing career, Mick Schumacher has achieved 29 wins. He's also achieved 51 podiums. He started from pole 15 times. And he has achieved 16 faster slaps. And his most recent championship is the FIA Formula 3 European Championship in the 2018 season. Thank you very much, Mark. And Katie, over to you with the stats for Robert Schwartzman. OK, so he's uh, he's taken part in 165 races. Uh, 16 of those were wins. Um, he was on the podium 63 times. Um, he has been on pole 20 times. And his last championship was the FIA Formula 3 Championship last year, in 2019. And, oh, sorry, fastest laps, 22. Thank you very much, Katie. And for me to round up, I have Callum Eilat. And he has um, competed in 163 races. He has 11 wins to his name, 14 pole positions, 32 podiums. He does currently have no championships compared to the other two. Fastest lap 16, the same as Mick Schumacher, and his last year's position was 11th in F2. One position ahead of Mick Schumacher, actually, from there. Um, but now we're going to swing back to Mark, and he's going to pitch to us why Mick Schumacher's racecraft is the best. Hey, we can see in some races, mainly, I think Rush is some of the best example of his race cars with some of the overtakes he managed to pull off and the way he guided the car. He's a very flowing driver. He flows in and out of corners and he he doesn't do the traditional dive bomb as much. You can, well, I'm using Rush again as an example. He overtook in the semicircle corner by just choosing the better line and slowly um, getting ahead that way. He's a very almost old-style driver. Not He overtakes by picking better lines and by building up a better pace and not by pulling off dive bombs or trying to outbreak, although he does, of course, do that. So I think his racecraft is exceptional. So, Katie, handing over to you, to Robert Schwartzman. Pitch us what you think is good about his racecraft. OK, well, his his race pace is obviously great um, for the you know for the amount of wins and podiums that he's had so far um, he's also really good at uh, his you know defensive driving um, 
give an, an example of that would be when he was in Formula Renault 2.0 um, and he was at the front and Lando was behind him for the whole race um, and obviously was trying to get past for quite a lot of it um, and just the way he defended in that race um, and almost lost it at the last corner um, but just broke a bit later than Lando um, just to, to keep the win so I think his, his defensive driving is great um, and he's also kind of quite a bold overtaker as well like he'll take the outside line um, quite a lot and you know not necessarily go for the easy overtake so like Belgium uh, race two was a good example of that. So I think he's kind of good all round. His, his defensive driving, his defensive driving is great. His overtaking is great, and his pace, his race pace is great. So he's, you know, he's just all round good racecraft for me. So thank you very much, Katie. And now for me with Callum Eilot. and Callum Eilot, uh, he's always been a driver who has shown kind of uh, good pace and potential. Uh, that's obviously why he's been part of the Ferrari Academy. Um, but I, I think really last year's F2 was where um, he really blossomed and he started to kind of really, he kind of found his feet in that car, especially in the later part of the season. And he's a quick driver. And when he's on track, you know, he uses that pace advantage and he's able to quickly make up the gaps Um between himself and drivers which you know is important in kind of spec series because the cars are very similar but obviously me and mark have discussed in previous feeder series episodes not quite equal in terms of how everything works out but yes his overtaking uh, i think he's a very good overtaker but uh, i think i'll probably concede um out of <laughs> this one to you two he is a strong overtaker but i would say he's the late bloomer out of the three of them um, he, he's always had potential, but I don't think he's quite shown uh, his upper echelons of his racecraft to date. But it's still been very good, um, and F2 was certainly some high performances from last year. So we now go back to Mark, and we are going to ask him to give us Mick Schumacher's out and out one lap pace. Out and out one lap pace is probably not his strongest um, area, but but at the same time, we saw it in his F3 champ championship year that he does have amazing one lap pace, but it seems to take a while to come through. We started to see it last year in F2 as it went on, he just got faster and faster. He seems to be a driver that wants to be really really confident in the car and his ability with that car before he wants to push it too fast so i think at the start of the season he would not be the strongest in the pace but by the end he would have to be the one of the strongest pace wise and katie over to you with robert okay um i actually think qualifying is probably the one area like his one race pace is probably something that he needs to work on the most I think going forwards because it's kind of a bit if you look at his results last year in qualifying they were kind of a bit of a mixed bag um, and you think if he managed if he manages to kind of consistently get that one lap pace his qualifying position is going to be a lot higher um, and obviously that will mean you know more potential for race wins and getting on the podium so he's had kind of like you know a 10th 6th couple of fourth places so it's it's yeah the consistency is not quite there yet so i think that's would be you know would be the one thing i think he needs to focus on for f2 next year and rounding off with callum eilot i actually think his pace is uh callum eilot's biggest strength um I, I think well his pole position at monza comes to mind in terms of f2 last year that was a very good uh qualifying lap and to be quick at monza obviously the temple of speed um it is really hard to kind of find those little extra fine margins and uh i'm sure there was a little bit of towing going on uh which we saw obviously cause chaos in q3 in f1 as well um it was I mean, to be fair the f2 guys did qualify a lot better than the f1 guys but the f3 i mean i don't know what was worse the f3 qualifying or or q3 for the f1s that, that year i mean probably the uh f3 seeing as a lot of them got kind of punishments uh, for but, what they did but they did similar things to the f1 guys so i thought the f1 guys should have got punishments they should they should have done that's fair but back to calamilo 
Um, so I, I, I would say, you know, the 14 pole positions, obviously out of the two, he does have the lower stats, but I think this is definitely the area where he kind of shows off and, uh, you know, which keeps him exciting and probably is why Ferrari attach themselves to him because he's a natural quick driver. It's just converting those in the race a little bit more than he currently does so. And, um, yeah, really kind of pushing because he hasn't always necessarily been in the top, top teams as well and uh, coming up through the ranks. So we now move on to our final category before we go on to conclusion, and that is consistency. So Mick Schumacher. For Mick, his consistency is one of his strongest factors. We saw it last year in F2 that he, he was, uh, although he didn't finish strongly, he finished consistently. Although he did have a few DNFs, most of them were mechanical failure or damage related, and I think only one race, you could argue, was his fault damage-wise. But if you go back to F3 another year back in 2018, although he did have a rough start, after that he was consistently on the podium. He, he's a Once he knows the car and is confident in it, he's consistent, he is fast, and he's an all-round... He's, very, he's a very complete driver in the terms of once he knows the car, he can, he can get the most out of it consistent, consistently. And Katie, over to you with Robert. I'm going to have to disagree with Mark, I'm afraid. I think Rob's consistency is is, uh, is better than Mick's. Um, I can give you some examples of that as well. <laughs> um, so if we're talking last year in, uh, in F3, um, actually the only weekend that he didn't get a podium, either in the feature race or the sprint race was in Hungary um, so all the other race all the other circuits he, he was on the podium at um, and there was three weekends where he was on the podium twice for both the feature and the sprint race um, so you know you can't get a lot more consistent than that can you um, and then there's kind of there's other examples as well in you know in his um, earlier career like when he did the Toyota racing series in 2018 um, and he was actually the only driver that season to finish all of the it was 15 races in the top five. Um, so that's a you know that's a fairly impressive feat as well. Um, so yeah, he, he's he's always you know on the podium or thereabouts, and I just you know it's, he's just got a great consistency uh, you know level. Um, I actually have stats as well on their podium percentages so far. So like in all the competitions um, and he actually comes out the highest out of the three of them so he's like 38% um, Mix is Mix is about 29 and Callum's is just under 20 so you know you can't you can't argue with the stats can you oh look at that boom drop I already Mark Mark stay calm I know you want to fight back oh. but the conclusion will be coming I can already tell this is going to get fiery between you two. Um, so consistency, I would say this is uh, Callum Eilert's uh, weak point. Um, in 2018 was his best uh, career finish to date in terms of uh, third in the GP3 series. He, uh, I think just over the course of the season, he struggled to put his pace and really maximise his potential through the season. Although what I will say, which is a big plus on his consistency, is towards the end of the F2 season, he started to get comfortable. He started to kind of um, get good. He got some very good um, results for Chiru's, um well, Sauber junior team powered by Chiru's or however we say it from there. Um and which obviously has earned him to a big seat in F2, which is for Uni Virtuosi, which, you know, is one of the top seats in F2 currently. And so, you know, he must have done something to impress uh, and be solid to get that position. And yeah, I, I think he found his feet with that F2 car a little bit better than what Mick Schumacher did. Obviously, you know, finishing... Um, 11th, uh, one place ahead of Mick Schumacher in the championship. So we now move on to conclusions. And um, yes, I, I suppose this, this potentially could get out of hand. But um, <laughs> right, we let's go with... So 
Mark, is is there any points that you've heard that you would like to dispute or challenge? This is mainly... No. What Katie has said about Schwartzman is correct, but also she needs to acknowledge that when he first enters a championship, he is he is not those things. The most recent example is when he first entered the F3... When he entered the first to the first F3 championship. First year he was 12th and he struggled. I think well, that... you could say the same for me, to be fair, Mark, because it exactly. always takes him a couple of you years can. to get to the so, that, so, so, yeah, by, so by your acknowledgement, Mick does have the advantage in the championship then. By that, not by, by your own acknowledgement of Robert taking a while to get used to the car and getting good. Well, I think they're both, they were they could, you could say that no, so that doesn't mean that Mick's better. They but both take a, lot, a little bit of time. So. They do, but Mick's had that year in F2 now. Robert hasn't. No, no, that's true. That's very true. I have to concede on that point. I, I think... And you have to admit, once, once Mick gets a hand on the car, you can just look at his 2018 F3 drive. Once he gets a hand on that car, he is a very, very dominant driver. You couldn't say the same about Robert. Robert was consistent all the time. He was always on the podium, but he was never as dominant as Mick was once they both know the car. No, that's true. He's, he's not as dominant, but he you know, he, he goes about it a different way. He's just a consistent driver and gets the points that way. I mean, if you look at Mick, once he got a handle on the F3 car, he was dominant and he was consistent. Yeah, yeah, true. I'll give you that. I think I'm going to jump in here in terms of... So, yeah, I, I think Mick does have the advantage. And for me, I haven't seen... I, I Look, all three of them are superbly talented guys. And I, I think we, we spoke about it. Um, well, we've spoken about it before off-camera and on-camera and stuff. We, we believe Callum Eilert's kind of a little bit forgotten in his talent um he's kind of swept under the carpet or two to the kind of you know glory boys of robert schwartzman and mick schumacher uh the second season syndrome is really interesting and for me it does give the advantage to mick schumacher in this battle i haven't really seen anything from robert that suggests he's going to come in and blitz to the f2 title right i just want to add this point as well uh robert also seems to have second syndrome season I, he does. He does. He appears to improve. I, I think um, both are probably destined for F1 in some way or form. But the we, thing we is... We saw it in Formula Renault that he, he does have second season syndrome. He starts off a bit rough and he gets better in the second season. Yeah, and uh, you know it takes time to adapt to these cars. Um, it'd be interesting to see because I think Robert is a better driver um certainly than when he was in those kind of second season syndromes uh before so out of any of the rookies coming forward from that kind of ferrari junior academy and uh, probably the rookies overall entering uh the sport he probably has the best chance to be the highest achiever i will expect him to be in the title challenge um it's going from net callum Eilert for me I think he's that wild card. The pressure's off him. All the press will be looking at Schwartzman and Schumacher. And I just feel that he kind of found his happy place um, in F2 last year, that he could quietly sneak up on things. He was starting to improve on his things, like his race craft and consistency within the race. He's always had that natural pace and quicker. And probably, um, you know... It may be difficult to kind of say this, but I think probably quicker than uh, Mick and Robert Schwartzman currently on their best days. He could probably put together a quicker one lap. It's just finding what the other two have over him, which is actually the races, which is obviously where you score uh, your points. But I, I think Callum very much is a, he's a wild card to look out for. Uh, in terms of and still a very talented driver within his own right absolutely yeah, yeah. totally agree I can see Callum Eilert going 
I want to see him in F1 because I think he does have the pace for it, but not the consistency. But I could see Callum Eilert, depending on how this season goes, ending up in Formula E. And I don't mean that as an insult. With how Formula E is going now, I think that is a compliment. I can see him going to a top Formula E team. I think that might necessarily be a fair assessment of things. And I, I think we've both kind of... Well, all three of us have kind of had chances to pitch and kind of we discussed, we've heard the points of other drivers. So, Mark, on what you've heard, this is a driver rivalries. We, we do discuss who's better. And um, we're going to go with who, ranking them out of the three, what would your order be for the three drivers in this F1 who's better driver rivalry? Are we going based on who we think is going to finish highest in the F2 championship or just on personal opinion on where we rate them? I'm going to go on personal opinion on where you rate them. Mick, Rob, Callum. And Katie, I asked the same question to you. I'm going with the order that you announced them in at the start of the video, Mike, and that is uh, Rob Mick and then Callum. Uh, I think that's fair to go. For me, it is very close between Mick and Rob because they've both won championships. They're both successful. Uh, Robert has a little bit more variety than what Mick does in terms of championships won. He's been he's been around the globe and in, competed in a few winter series a little bit more than what Mick has done. Uh -huh. Mick's mainly been in Europe, but he's done he's done better in Europe than Robert has. Well, correct, yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, going to different continents and going on different tracks and being exposed to different people and different teams and how they run is is an advantage. A stretch. He's only really done done Macau and the TRS. Well, you know, I it's still it's still there, and I'm just you know I'm I'm saying it's a little bit of extra experience, Mark. You know, I I'm saying it's a factor that has to come into it for me. Um, I I think for me, I personally feel oh dear dear I I'm so torn between the two of Mick and Rob. I'm going to go with Mick Schumacher because that was my gut instinct before. I don't think he's just a name. I do actually think he's a very talented driver with it. I like the maturity that he's shown in terms of he hasn't necessarily progressed uh, quicker than he could have done um, because he wanted to make sure that he was ready for each series. I like the fact that he takes his time to kind of, you know, get to learn a series and then the next year he makes his push for the championship because although you don't have time in your junior career I think you also do have time a lot more time than what you have in F1 so it's better to take that time and really learn your skills and he just seems a really mature head Robert Schwartzman is a very close second for me uh, I think like I said earlier in the video I think both are destined for F1 I think Mick will probably get there before Rob um, and it'll be interesting to see in the future how they both develop. Um, with Callum, I, I said he's a wild card. I, I think he, he's one of those drivers, a bit like Jack Aitken, a bit like Luca Giotto was, in terms of clearly has a lot of talent. Um, it's whether this is kind of a big season for him and a big team. Can he prove that he's he's got it? And he he could quite easily... You know, it, if Robert and Mick get too absorbed in a title battle between themselves, he could quite easily surprise and be a real standout. But Mark said a point of he could quite easily see him ending up in Formula E. And I think that's a really fair point. I, I think that probably will be the way that he destines and lines up. A lot of young British drivers end up in Formula E and I, I can see Callum going the same way. So in conclusion to this... It is a two to one. I think I was the deciding vote in this. Uh, me and Mark are going for Mick Schumacher. Katie is going for Robert Schwartzman. But what we're really yeah. interested in is who you guys think is better. And we'd love to know your reasons below. 
in terms of what you think is there. You've heard us have our thoughts. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you're new around here, you can subscribe to the channel, click that bell notification, and you can keep up to date with all our latest content. But we're going to say round off now. And Katie, a very big thank you for coming on and defending. I know, obviously, you're a big fan of Robert. He is one that you're kind of keeping close to, and I'm sure it has potential of making it into your kind of uh, quite close group of drivers that you support but thank you very much for coming on it was great to have you on again anytime thanks for having me it's been really fun again no problem at all mark i suppose i thank you but you're, you're here as a resident as the feeder series your knowledge and expertise and fierce fighting for your uh beliefs in your corner are always fierce fantastic logic. fierce logic <laughs> there we go you see look even there uh but no mark as always been fantastic but guys hope you've enjoyed this episode but for now uf1 fans keep racing <laughs>